So I'll greet you by saying Ming Laba. That's the way we greet people in Myanmar. And um, I'm going to talk to you today about my experiences there on a trip I took in February of 2011. Now this was only one month before historic changes started taking place in what was a very repressive regime. Many people had never heard of Myanmar before, and all of a sudden that spring it was catapulted to front page news. Myanmar used to be Burma. In eight, 1989, the ruling military junta changed the name to Myanmar, a year after thousands were killed in the suppression of a popular uprising. The name of the capital city was changed from Rangoon to Yangon. Now, somebody had asked me if I would show a map so you could be sure uh, to know where Myanmar was. You see that lovely purple area there, that is Myanmar. Uh, by geographical area, Myanmar is the second largest country in Southeast Asia. One third of its total perimeter of 1,200 miles is in uninterrupted coastline. It's bordered by China on the northeast, Laos on the east, Thailand to the southwest, Bangladesh on the west, India to the northwest, and the Bay of Bengal to the southwest. So Myanmar has loads of neighbors. Now, although the crux of my talk is going to be to share my traveling experiences with you, we really have to start by looking at what's been going on in this country. So I'm going to back up to some post-World War II events. January 4th, 1948, Burma achieves independence from the British. 1961, Uthant from Burma became the first non-Westerner elected Secretary General of the UN. March of 1962, General Nguyen set up the military government that stayed in power until March of 2011. July of 1962, a peaceful student protest at Rangoon University was brutally suppressed by the military. Over 100 students were killed, and the student union was dynamited. Arrests began, and the government was so fearful of large gatherings that they broke up the main university campus into smaller bits located all over the country, just to prevent gatherings. 1964, all opposition political parties were banned. Commerce and industry was nationalized, and the win began the process of isolating Myanmar from the rest of the world. July of 1988, Nguyen stepped down following protests against his rule, but the military regime continued, remained in power, and civilian unrest grew as the standard of living continued to decline. May of 1990, the National League for Democracy, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, won 82% of the assembly seats in the first nationwide election in three decades but the military never handed over power. 1991, Aung San Suu Kyi won the Nobel Peace Prize for her struggle for democracy and human rights. Now the government expected her to pay taxes on her winnings even though she was held under house arrest in Yangon. How's that for a deal? And as you may know, she was put in and out of house arrest over many years. In the year 2000, the EU stepped up economic sanctions against Myanmar because of human rights abuses. 2005, the government moved the capital from Yangon to Naypyidaw in the center of the country. 2007, protests led by monks following fuel price hikes were quashed, and they had called this the Saffron Revolution. You may remember in 2008, this bad cyclone Nargis killed tens of thousands of people. And afraid of Western intervention, the government refused to let Western aid in for quite a long time until international pressure made them take it. And that cyclone happened only two days before what was going to be a general election, the first election held in nearly two decades. Never mind that nobody could come to vote, the election took place anyway. And of course, the election was rigged, so what? March 30th of 2011, not that long ago, the military junta was dissolved to make way for a civilian government. They released some political prisoners and relaxed some media restrictions. Why were they doing this? 
Well, there are a couple of reasons. Now, for starters, the 78-year-old head honcho was ready to retire. He had his guys in place. He wanted to see a, a smooth transition to the people of his choice. So that is, was his way of handling things. And the other thing was to attract much needed foreign investment to a country that only 50 years ago was one of Southeast Asia's most prominent and wealthiest, the world's biggest rice exporter and a major energy producer. So in 2000, uh, November 18th of 11, Obama announced that he would send Hillary Clinton to Myanmar, a dramatic move because she would be the first Secretary of State to visit Myanmar in more than 50 years. So Hillary arrived on November 30th, and Obama's goal was to loosen the ties that the military rulers had with China. China and Myanmar were having some tensions, uh, and China was um, the second biggest trading partner for Myanmar after Thailand. And Beijing had poured billions of dollars of investment into Myanmar to operate mines, extract timber, build oil and gas pipelines. But the U.S. wanted to capitalize on what was becoming a very strained relationship. Now, Myanmar decided they were going to suspend work on a hydroelectric dam project that was backed by China because China intended to consume most of the energy generated by it, giving nothing to the people of Myanmar. So resentment was happening. Myanmar said, nope, get out of here. And Obama says, good time for us to sort of get in there, get comfortable, and loosen those ties with China. January of 2012, the U.S. restored full diplomatic relations. Now, mind you, relations were never completely severed, as they were with, with Iran, Cuba, and North Korea, but they were downgraded after the 1990 elections when we withdrew our ambassador. So in April, Aung San Suu Kyi um, and members of her party were finally allowed to run for office. And she took her place in Parliament on May 2nd, and she gained the respect that she had so long deserved. But she warned at this point of lifting, she warned Hillary of lifting sanctions completely. She wanted the government to be on its toes, um, and she, she just wanted to go easy on it and not move full forward. So Hillary took her advice and said that sanctions would be, remain in place as a sort of an insurance policy. So she did emphasize that our goal was to move ahead and expand business and investment opportunities. So in May, Obama said, okay, for American businesses to go in and make investments in Myanmar. But they wouldn't be allowed, however, to work with the country's armed forces or corporations closely linked to them. And they have to ensure that they aren't supporting anything or anyone repressing political rights or participating in ethnic conflicts, two major concerns of human rights groups. Now, last summer, Hillary met with the president of Myanmar, Thanh Sen, in Cambodia, in Siem Reap, Cambodia, and she really cheered him on because this former military uh, junta general has made great strides in the last 15 months. He's begun to liberalize Myanmar's economy, released 670 political prisoners, at least, permitted more media freedom, and allowed the formation of political parties and held peace talks with some of the rebels. And there are still issues with human rights and warring tribes, and uh, there's a, a, a province that, um, where the Muslims are a minority and battling with Buddhists, and there are still human rights concerns, but things overall are getting much better. So we finally announced the easing of um, a ban on imports to Myanmar to reward its progress that it's made toward democracy. And the import ban had been the main plank of remaining American sanctions against the country. So uh, just recently, last month, Aung San Suu Kyi came to visit, and she got the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor, our highest award. So the biggest question that still remains for some people and certainly remained when I went, to go or not to go? So. Back to when I went, before the beginning of any re reform, that was, you know, what do you do? It, it poses a dilemma. Uh, should the enthusiastic traveler refuse to go there on principle? Does visiting the country and spending my dollars there so sh show support for the last reigning military junta, and now its remnants? And my answer to that would be an emphatic no. Now, granted, you have to pay some small entry fees to, to some tourist sites and a $10 airport departure tax that went to the government. 
But overall, our money went to local people and businesses, including our domestic flights on private airlines. We did not travel with government airlines. Now, I went with an Australian adventure company whose philosophy is to make positive contribution toward those businesses and organizations that have social or environmental roles in the local community. And I also, as a travel agent, work with a few American tour companies who have that same philosophy. And then you have to think about it this way, too. If we don't go over and talk to them, they won't know what we're like, they won't know how we live, and they won't know anything else. So I think it's extremely important. Now, we as travelers back then uh, were not affected by the political climate at all. We knew of the government repressions, of course, um, and the way they would treat their political dissidents. But we never felt any atmosphere of repression at all, and nor were we restricted in moving about the country. Some countries you go to, if you go to Tibet, the Chinese tell you where to go and when to eat, and it's all very regulated. This was not like that at all. Our guide did tell us, interestingly, there were two very good things that the regime has accomplished, which both had an effect on us. First, learning English in primary school is mandatory, so people did pretty well speak English. And the other thing is that the government really eradicated crime, albeit through terror. You know, if you know that you're going to be, people were afraid to commit any kind of a petty offense for being thrown in jail, which leaves the streets very safe. So as a traveler, you, you know, people will speak English and you don't have to feel the least bit unsafe. Now, I can recall two particular instances when we noticed signs of the ruling military. We went up to the top of Mandalay Hill for a view of the city. And in one direction, there was this enormous prison. Now, why would you have an enormous prison in a country with no crime? Of course, for the political prisoners. And in Yangon, we went up to the sixth floor of our hotel and to get great views of the city. And from there, we detected these empty army barracks all over the place. Empty now that the government had moved out of Yangon into the center of the country to Naypyidaw. Da. And also what we took to be an abandoned parliament building. Now, the generals in about 2006 built their capital in secret and announced it to the public once it was a fait accompli. And I would like to read to you this quote uh, from a newspaper. The nine-hour drive north of the former capital, Yangon, looks like nothing else in this impoverished country, where one in three children is malnourished and travelers appreciate pothole pavement because many roads are nothing more than dirt tracks. It would be easy to write off the move to Naypyidaw as a caprice of the secretive generals who had been in power for 46 years. But the transfer of the entire bureaucracy to this relatively remote location where malaria is still endemic and cell phones do not work has drained the country's finances and widened the gulf between rulers and the ruled. Even the most charitable observers of Myanmar's junta portray themselves as out of touch. Now, they're literally out of sight. The generals live and work in a guarded zone of Naypyidaw that is off limits to all but senior officers. Now, when we asked a, a citizen of Myanmar about the government, what did they think of the government? This man, of course, said, do not quote me, but he gave me a big smile and he said, they don't care about us and we don't care about them. So how do you like that one? Now, getting there. I flew Singapore Airlines from JFK to Singapore. And given that I had to stop in Singapore, why not spend several days in Singapore, which, by the way, is a really great place. And then from there, we continued on to Yangon. So I would say that the total flight time was about 20 hours. The time difference was 11 and a half hours from here. And the currency, one dollar, one of our dollars, equaled about 820 Myanmar chats. That word is pronounced chats. Now, there were a couple of things that really surprised me about Myanmar. First of all, the accommodations whoops, were much better than I expected. I mean, I really didn't know what to expect. I thought it would be pretty basic and pretty seedy. But we stayed in a lovely hotel called the Summit Park View, geared toward foreign travelers and businessmen. And forget using your cell phone. Verizon can't operate over there. Uh, access was forbidden. Um, but the hotel did have a business center, and they had internet, which of course never worked. 
I'm not sure if it, it was a pretense of saying, yes, we have it. Um, sometimes they'd say to you, oh, well, it's not working now. Maybe you try tomorrow. And it really wasn't worth wasting your time because it just never really worked. But the hotel was beautiful. It had restaurants, spas, gift shops, all this for all of about $40 a night, air conditioned and everything. And this hotel had a very busy, busy banquet hall. As soon as we arrived, we, we found ourselves in the middle of this wedding. And here you see the groom is British, so he looked quite out of place with all the Asian family he was marrying into. And he did look so elegant with this cute little hat, but we looked down at his feet and he was wearing flip-flops. <laughs> and there's the wedding, everybody dressed up so pretty. So, you know, obviously people did have some money. The wealthy always have money, and sometimes in the capital that's where you see it. You never really see it outside of a capital city. Uh, for nice hotels, this was the pool at one of my hotels in Bagan. And now that things are really opening up, the hotels are really getting nice and expensive. And this was a beautiful place we stayed at uh, called the Hoopin Lodge on Inley Lake, where you go and you look at all the ethnic tribes. And it was just gorgeous there. Um, very nice. We had, these are our little basic room with our bug nets, and, and the dining hall sort of looks like Hogwarts, doesn't it? <laughs> And then we, uh, it was beautiful. I love that picture. And uh, this was our very last place where we were on the beach at a really nice resort called Sunny Paradise. And the grounds were perfectly manicured and the level of staff was impeccable. And we had gorgeous sunsets over the Indian Ocean while having lovely dinners and drinks on the patio by the pool. And you'll see some of those sunset pictures in my slideshow because when I'm done talking, I'm gonna give you a 10 minute slideshow set to music. Now the highlight though was the spa. I got my hair washed and styled for $5. How's that? I had a one hour Thai massage for $20. And for all the massages I've had all over the world, this one was really memorable. Because this young spry girl used her whole body to knead me, sit on me, poke at me. She used my dead weight for resistance and she pushed and she tugged. And for me, I'm used to deep tissue massage, so I, I was not really bothered. I was, uh, didn't dare open my eyes, though. But my poor friend who was getting worked on next to me was entirely black and blue for the next week. <laughs> now, the second thing that surprised us was that the country was a lot more developed than we expected, but that development seemed confined to the cities. We were told that because of the sanctions, without enough foreign investment, there was just little to boost developing industry. And even with China, it just wasn't nearly enough. So we were surprised to see a fair amount of cottage industry, especially around the Inley Lake area. And after watching some of the workers and listening to explanations, we could always count on a full-scale shop at the end and stuff to buy, always things to buy. So we looked at sculpture making, which usually does center on religious art and loads more Buddhas than you could imagine, weaving, Bronze making, um, there's the weaving still, very fashionable. Bronze making, silver making. The lacquer is gorgeous. And painting everywhere you go. But the thing that I really got a kick out of were these gorgeous umbrellas, huge, big, colorful umbrellas. Now, don't ask me what I thought I was gonna do with these umbrellas, but of course I had to have them. And I don't just get one, I have to have one in every color. So I bargained for about five of them and finally, I got them for about $8 each. And the, the man beautifully wrapped them for me in brown paper, made a handle so I could get them home. And we had a few days of traveling before we were gonna get back to the Capitol. And I put this package up on top of the bus. A Couple days later, I go to get it down and that brown paper was all stained with dripping butter because how they waterproof these umbrellas is with diesel fuel and butter. And they hadn't completely dried yet. Great. So there I am with this, this really disgusting package, but I was gonna keep these umbrellas, and I thought, well, the hotel was so nice about having me patch them up and make it look nice so I could get through customs with everything. And then, of course, I brought them home in the dead of winter, opened them up to dry in my basement, and were just lucky the stuff just didn't go flammable. My basement stunk of diesel fuel for about a month, and they finally did dry, but I don't know what to do with them. 
Uh, and there's the lovely gentleman who sold them to me. And you can see how big these things are, but I get these ideas in my head. I've just got to have it. I'm there. So if anybody needs to borrow an umbrella. Now, we also watched a gold leaf making demonstration that was really quite interesting because, and I show it to you because Myanmar is called the Golden Land. Everything is about gold. The Burmese love gold. They use it everywhere, on their pagodas, their monasteries, musical instruments, jewelry. Everything is gilt. 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 Um, so here is the demonstration. And this is the way they laid it out for us. Gold leaf takes a beating. And they show you making gold ribbon from solid gold. Okay, So you increase the size of it by beating it for 30 minutes. And that, that's the first time of beating. Then you cut that piece into six pieces, and you beat again for another 30 minutes, second time beating. And then you increase the size more by beating for five hours. Very good for aggression, <laughs> aggression issues. And so finally, it's thin, 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 and they package them up in paper and in, in a square package to buy. And there are the girls you know, getting it all together and bundled up. Now let's take a look at two very important religious sites in Myanmar that both dazzle with gold. And the first one is the Shwedagon Pagoda in Yangon. Now it's a stupa, the shape of a stupa. A stupa is a Buddhist monument in the shape of a cone, often thought to have held the relics of the Buddha. So maybe once upon a time there was relics of the Buddha in some stupa, but now of course it's a symbolic shape that is used in all Buddhist temples and worship. Now that one big stupa that you saw is really unbelievable. Um, but it's, 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 I'll just back up, 80%, 89% of the people in Myanmar are Buddhist. Okay. Now the Shwedagon sits on a, a, a hill about 190 feet above sea level. So you can just imagine how that big stupa dominates the landscape. But there's so much more really than meets the eye because the whole site of the Shwedagon is 12 acres and has more than 60 golden stupas around the perimeter of the complex. And it's a real scene, people coming, going, making offerings, praying. You've got your praying monks, your worshipers, and then Hillary doing the same thing, making an offering to this Buddha when she was there. But what really got to me I thought I'd seen it all, were the Buddhas with flashing neon light halos. You think you've seen it all. And there is that beautiful stupa at night, as seen from our hotel floor. It was very useful up there. And that big orb on top, it's studded with 1,800 carats of diamonds, real diamonds. So the next golden site that's very important is this country is a place called Golden Rock. And it sits way up on top of a mountain that I can't even pronounce. But as you know, I mean, you, if you just looks like if you took one breath and blew, it would just come over. And legend has it that a hermit bought, brought the king a hair from the Buddha. And for thanks, he said, oh, just keep it under a rock that's in the shape of my head or something like that. But it's true with any pilgrimage sites you go to anywhere. It's the difficulty of making the journey to get there that's important, the process of reaching the final destination. They never make it easy. You always see pilgrims barefoot. They travel all night to get there for sunset. Um, and we had a very interesting trip up to this rock ourselves. So first, we climbed altitude to the base camp. And then they loaded us into this hell truck. And we got packed into this truck. Your body was merging with the four people around you, front, back, and sideways. You didn't even have room to grasp the seat underneath you. You couldn't see in front of you. And then up we go along curvy, crazy roads to get up top. It was like being on a ride at Six Flags, and you couldn't see where you were going and when the next turn was coming. So finally, we get out, and the vehicle spews out its human contents. And there are the sedan chair carriers waiting to carry you up the rest of the way for all of $8. Now, I'm fit, and I would never do this, even though it's nice to support the local economy. But I had such bad bronchitis, I couldn't even breathe. I was actually quite sick on this trip and coughed so badly night and day that I, I was surprised my roommate will still travel with me. And we are off to Mexico this week. But I had to say I enjoyed that sedan ride 
And if you ever feel the least bit guilty for being overweight, these poor guys, uh, four people to get you up there. And once you're up there, you see all the monks praying. And there's that gorgeous, gorgeous rock. And then we spent a full day floating down the Irrawaddy River to get to another religious site. Much less glitzy, yet dazzling in different respects, is the 11th century capital of Bagan, or Pagan. And it's covered with 4,000 temples and stupas. And it was here I decided that if I could give Myanmar another name, give this, rename this country, I was going to call it Stupaville. <laughs> so we spent all day climbing temples and stupas and wandering around this dusty yet delightful site. And we ended our day with a climb up the main temple for a beautiful sunset. But my favorite temple site was something much, much smaller in scale. The funniest part was going to the site. We had to walk through this great big, huge covered thing full of stuff to buy. And then we got into this beautiful old, old temple site. It has about a thousand, over a thousand stupas, some very old, about 11th century, um, many of them much newer. But they're small in scale, and you can see how dilapidated and in ruin they are. It's almost sad. I love the tree going, growing up right out of the top of that one. And, but it's sad. They don't keep anything up. And um, the carvings on them really were so beautiful, just beautiful. And it's a small scale. Here's this little temple, and you can see from the size of me that these are small. And I just found this place charming. So now let's take a look at some different areas of the country city, country, lake, and beach. Now, in Yangon, interesting, drivers aren't allowed to use their horns. So it's a fairly quiet city, whereas in Mandalay, they lean on the horns, and it's much noisier. So that's kind of interesting. Everything takes place on the street, eating, cooking, flower selling. This woman is looking at smelly, salted, dry fish. And the finest building in town is this high court building. And you, you know, smacks of colonial, colonialism, of British empire. But sadly enough, most of these lovely old buildings are really falling into disrepair. And we definitely got the sense that once the government pulled out of Yangon and moved their capital, that they were not taking care of the city anymore. Good luck trying to walk on the sidewalks. Good luck. Um, now we'll move to country, and there's a big dichotomy here, because outside of the big cities, now we're getting very, very rural, but rural like you're really going back in time. Everything is done by hand. There's no mechanization at all. This farmer is waiting for his water buffalo to take a bath here. And you've got plowing. You've got bathing and washing in the river. Um, you move hay by piling it up and getting the oxen to go. And uh, there's the oxen. People carrying things. Fascinating topic. Around the world, people carry things. And I'm going to do an exhibit at the Forbes Library in Northampton this summer. Who carries what, why, and how? Very interesting when you look at your pictures from all over the world and see who's doing it, what they're carrying. Um, and this was so neat. These little canals along the country were dotted with these lovely little bridges made out of bamboo poles. So you get to be a tightrope walker and sort of balance yourself on this little bamboo pole and hold these two really stringy looking bamboo poles to cross that. And don't think I tried that. And overladen stuff. I mean, they just load it on. There are bags of rice going all over the place. And you, you know, you can't imagine that this truck wouldn't fall over sideways. And in Tibet, I did see a truck fall over sideways. It got stuck in the mud, went plop. The whole town stopped, and they had to wait hours. We had to just wait. It was one road, and, and nobody was going anywhere for about six hours. So it was nice that our bus kept a little bit of a distance uh, behind something like this. Uh, now we go to the beach. And the beach was also a very interesting place. Um, the, as I said, there's 1,200 miles of coastline here. So my morning walk could be at least three hours, and I could have gone and gone and gone. But you do get hot. So in the morning, you get the fishermen. And there's always stuff for sale. People are playing. Now, the guys are having fun. But notice these Asian women who were visiting. I think they were from China. I'm not really sure. But they don't wear bathing suits. They just go in in their clothes. The only women to wear bathing suits would be us. 
And this woman is selling her things. The guy selling his tires. I love that picture. And um, then I sort of was looking for shells, you know, walk, looking at my feet walking. And I heard this noise kind of like a look out. And I looked up and, and uh, oh, of course, you have your, your monks on the beach and religion on the beach, because you can't go anywhere in Myanmar without some religion. But I looked up on my walk, and there I was face to face with these cattle. And the guy looks at me, and I look at him, and I thought, oh, OK. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then we move. Oh, it, the town was awfully cute. The, the little town, the dusty little road of a town near our resort, where you see the bananas hanging, and the dried fish, lovely dried fish. And of course, in any beach town resort anywhere in the world, they're going to make stuff out of shells, because that's just what you do. And this woman, look at, she's using this great big ice block to do her cooking. And the girls, they're, you know, they're cooking, they're sewing, they chat. This is how they socialize. They just sit there and do their work, and they chat. And you can go to West Point for dinner. How's that? Um, and people were so friendly. This older couple actually asked us if we would like to come over to their house and visit. And our first response was, oh, no, no, that's OK. And, and I'm so sorry we didn't, really, because it would have been nice. Um, but then there were these two little girls. And the smiley one was all full of smiles. And her friend refused to smile. And finally, finally, I got that smile. Now you're going to wonder what's on their faces. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, a little later on, too. But now we're going to move to the lakes. And outside of Mandalay, in the town of Amarapu Amarapura, uh, is this very famous teakwood bridge, a pedestrian bridge over 200 years old, 1,300 feet long, and it's got more than 1,000 teak posts. And we took canoes to, uh, to get sunset views of this. It was just beautiful. And the bridge is full of bicycles, strollers, monks walking along. And of course, for your pictures, you really have to like Time it just right so you get the bicycles and the, the walkers in between the posts, so you get the right picture. And it was just great, just so beautiful there. And then we got to Inley Lake, and we traveled by these little dugout canoes through all of the inlets. And um, it's really like uh, watching people in their backyards. This vegetation actually grows on the water. It, it forms its own foundation, and they can even grow tomato plants right on it. It's like uh, floating gardens, really. And you, you, know, you just see everybody's laundry, their flowers, their cooking, the monks with his bowl. And everybody just looks up, and they're all so friendly. And this woman was making these super thin rice cakes. You know, you've tried to make a thin pancake, and usually you goof it up. Well, this was so, so thin. And she could lift it and flip it. And then you put them out to dry. You can see how brittle and thin those are. And um, there was grandma and grandpa there. And you, those faces are just fantastic. Now, what's really fun in, in Inley Lake is seeing their famous one-legged fishermen. Um, that's the way they fish. They row with one leg, and then they drop the basket, the conical basket, down, plunk it into the water to get their fish. So um, the lake is shallow and weed infested, and that's what they do. They sort of drop the basket down vertically to catch the fish. Now, then there is a tribe near the Thai border called the Paduang tribe. And they have an interesting custom that is fairly controversial. And you may have heard of the long neck women. Now, starting at around age 16, it's traditional custom for women to be fitted with brass rings around their neck, which weighs down the collarbone and the upper ribs, pushing the shoulders away so you get this very elongated neck. And initially, there's one really heavy one, and that, that sort of breaks things and gets things going. And then they start adding these other rings that stay on permanently. And guidebooks, of course, call this abuse. Um, they say that this is really horrible, that these women are out there uh, to be used to make tourist money or get money. Um, and our guide was really angry about that. He said, don't believe anything you read. This is a, a very old tradition. And once upon a time, supposedly, there were tigers running around and the rings kept the women from being bitten in the neck. Do you buy that one? <laughs> and that girls, of course, you know, this isn't forced on them. They have discussions with their parents and the village as to whether or not they want to do this. Well, how many young girls do you know that are capable of making a decision like that? So really, who's to know? Um, but I will say this much. The only place we saw these women 
was in tourist places where they would pose for pictures, take a little money, and then do a little bit of weaving. So you have to wonder. But it was interesting the way our guide was vehement that this is not something bad, it's tradition, and that they're not forced. So I don't know. But then I want to talk to you about some of the quirky things I noticed in this country. And this is a place called the Jumping Cat Monastery. Because over the years, over the centuries, the monks would have long, boring days, so they would teach cats to jump through hoops. And that's what they do, so they're very happy to give, you know, when tourists come in, they're very happy to give you a little performance. And the cats are very happy, of course, to have a treat. Um, and then, how weird is this? This monk in the same monastery is sitting next to this baby doll. And I couldn't figure that one out at all. They said, maybe it, if you wanted to come and pray for the health of your child or whatever, that baby doll was a substitute for like a real baby. Still sounded weird to me. Bigger is not necessarily better. This is, Buddha is in the town of Bago. And in Bago, they even have a pagoda bigger than the Shwedagon in Yangon. But this reclining Buddha measures 180 feet long by 53 feet high. And it's painted concrete. And I have to tell you, it's about the ugliest thing I've ever seen. There was nothing aesthetically pleasing about this Buddha. But what was, was interesting um, is that if you stood in just the right place, at just the right lighting, you could watch the Buddha achieve enlightenment. Mm -hmm. The sun was just there, and I thought, aha. Another weird thing are how people keep their hair up. They just stick a comb in it. <laughs> Okay, and uh, yes, gentlemen, you even have to come cough up flowers for your wife in Myanmar on Valentine's Day. You can't go anywhere in the world and escape that one. But I'm going to finish today by telling you about really a very memorable thing that happened to me on my very last day in the country. And my friend Margaret and I had the morning to ourselves to wander around before going to the airport. So we took a guidebook and figured we'll just make a route. Uh, we had a few hours. And there were these two little girls. And just bright-eyed, really sweet. And um, they looked at us. And I think they were trying to decide if they should skip school and follow us around all day, which is sort of what they did. So they started tagging along. And, and I got really like the little one. And believe it or not, they were like 14 and 15 years old. But people are small. And the children often look a lot younger than they are. Um, but, um, and the makeup, I told you, I'd tell you about this makeup. It's called Tanaka. And men wear it, children wear it, and women wear it. It's an herbal paste made from the bark of a tree that grows in Myanmar and around the Himalayas. And it's worn by everybody. It's good for the skin. It can cure skin irritation, acne, pimples, and sunburn. So it's good for the skin. But it's also light in color. And in these cultures, being fair is valued. If you're dark, you are a worker. So even in the fields, and you've seen Asian women often cover up. Big hats, long gloves, they cover their faces. They don't want the sun. They don't want to be tanned. So the light color makeup is considered a thing of beauty. So these girls follow us around, and we grab their hands and had fun. And I wanted to see the Strand Hotel, the old British hotel from 1914. And it was interesting, as we got up the steps to the hotel, the girls just knew to stay back. They knew that that wasn't a place that they could go into. They knew. And I took their hands, and we brought them in. And they had never seen such luxury in their lives. And they were so excited that the jewelry shop was closed, but they wanted their picture taken next to this, this Buddha here. And then we walked around some more, and we went to a Hindu temple, and they, they were so having fun with these pictures. And we walked along, and we bought them cookies and bracelets and things like that. And finally, we got to the marketplace, and I wanted to buy them each an outfit. And the little girl started saying, shoes, shoes. And I, I thought, yeah, yeah, there's, they, they didn't speak English. I thought, yeah, you know, there's loads of shoe places. Yep. And then, but she shows me her feet, and her flip flops were just dead. They were dead. So I had to go buy her a pair of flip flops. And the other girls didn't look too good either, and then they broke as well. And so I bought them flip flops. And the whole thing cost me like $12 for the two outfits and the flip flops. They were so happy. And finally, we had to get a cab and leave. And they just were so excited to jump right in and see where we were going to go next. And I thought the other strange thing, I offered them a Coke. And they looked at that Coke like they'd never had one and didn't know what it was or if it would be OK. 
uh, but we, we encouraged them. But, you know, we left them there. We had to get in the cab, and we gave them the biggest hugs, and my biggest regret was not giving them a, a card so that, that they would know who I was and be able to find me, because I really think of those little girls. I, if, if anyone has questions, I can try to answer them. I can't promise that I can. But um, it was a delightful place to go. The people were very friendly. And we had a lovely time. So you've been to other places in Asia. Yes. And um, so I'm interested, what is there unique about the food from that country compared to other Asian? It's very Southeast Asian food. Um, so rice all the time. One unique thing. I don't focus on food so you much. Don't. I don't. But you, rice is every meal, three times a day. And no, but I, I was proud of myself. I didn't. <laughs> eat, I, I ate none. I refuse. Um, no, great seafood, fresh, obviously great seafood. You know they eat so nicely. Um, small portions of really good food. Great spices. A lot of Chinese food too, which I don't tend to like. But um, their food's fabulous. But I, I can't say there was anything different about it, say, than some of the other Southeast mm -hmm. Asian countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, did the schools there cost money to go to? Um, I don't think so. Um, what I found in a lot of these countries, although I can't swear by it, if education is free, often they still need to buy uniforms and books and things, which prohibit a lot of people from really actually going. Mm -hmm. So it's never really free. And they, you know, obviously they do have a university, and um, but it's it's great that they do teach them English young. Yeah, although my little girls didn't speak any, I'll tell you that at the end. I'm surprised that you were allowed to take pictures of the monks, especially. They praying. did not Worshiping. mind. They, they mind. don't mind. Um, I've never found any monks to mind. Some of the monasteries I've been in don't let you take pictures inside. I remember in. Um, Sikkim in India, you know, certain ones wouldn't let you take them. But mostly they don't mind at all if you're not bothering them. When were you there? Ah, you missed the talk. It was uh, just a month before the election and all these reforms started to take place. So I went to the old Myanmar and a month later all these things started to happen. So that's what was really interesting. Who knew? So I was all prepared, you know, I, I do talks on my travels, but then this became a whole different ball game because it was all of a sudden different. I mean, nobody heard of Myanmar not that long ago. Yeah. Did you, did you see uh, or did you notice that uh, any of the monks were uh, on the internet and uh, No, uh, uh, forget the internet, it doesn't work there. I mean, they just- It doesn't work at all? Uh, well, they, they pretend, they, they pretend. They were very oriented towards the internet and, Video games. Yeah, um, in terms of any communication anyway, no. And no, I didn't see that. Not here, no. But I have been in countries where, you know, monks are real sort of riding around on motor motorcycles and yeah. doing things anybody does. But I never saw that, no. Yes? Um, you mentioned having bronchitis while you were there. I was really sick. Yeah, did you get treatment from any other facilities? Or no, I usually beg drugs off of all the people in my group. <laughs> and uh, they, I, I was really sick. Do you know how their facilities are, if anything? Good question, I don't. And once you get out of the cities, I'm sure there aren't any anyway. Um, I never did that, no. But it's interesting. This happens to me on occasion. And it, it's such bad coughing that I'm afraid I'm going to break a rib. And it, it never actually occurred to me to go anywhere for that. I just never did. No. Um, um, you had a question, another one? Yep, they'll barter and they'll bargain. I was just thinking. Yep, oh yeah, all those countries, yep. What's the population of the country? Oh goodness, I don't know. I don't know. And are they still called Burmese, the people? Yes, yeah. yes, the Bamar people are called Burmese and that's the majority. But I did prepare for a talk on Madagascar and they have 20 million people. <laughs> Myanmar, I, I don't know. But it's, it's, again, the second largest country in Southeast Asia. It's a big country area-wise. But I would, I don't know. Um, but it's so, it's so amazing from the city to the country. It's like a whole nother deal. So it's a fledgling democracy. We'll see. 
Time will tell they're trying. They need foreign money. I mean, they used to be the biggest rice producer in Southeast Asia, and they got to where they actually had to uh, import and still didn't get enough. I mean, the, the, they, they were run to the ground. They were a very prosperous country that was run to the ground. So we'll see. It's, this is all new stuff. Um, and a lot of human rights people and a lot of skeptics really don't buy any of it and aren't sure they'll ever do enough too quickly. But it's a move in the right direction, and they're being supported. Yeah. In a bus, we, we did have a guide. We also had a pretty decent bus, and we went all over the place, all over the place. So you picked the, you picked the tour? Or you I picked did, an Australian tour company. There were about 14 of us, maybe. Um, some British, some, uh, a couple Australians, mostly British. I was the only American. Do we have an embassy there, an American embassy? I'm sorry. Is the, there an American embassy there? Oh, no, there wasn't. There were no relations. Now there is. We are starting to send somebody over there. Whether or not they actually have an embassy, you know, as of last month or so, I, I don't know what they've got going. Uh, but, but I don't know. That's interesting. If we're going to have diplomatic ties, then I guess we'll have to build one. Well, that was another neat thing about Madagascar. We built this huge American embassy, huge. And then they had this big um, economic and bad downturn. You know, they sort of go through periods of, of rulers and then no government before the next thing, and it's a bad time. So 2009 was a very bad time. And no sooner did we build this big, huge em embassy, it's empty. I mean, stuff, stuff is weird around the world. But you know, we'll see. I mean, they're, they're wonderful people. And it's a fun place to go. So as an American, despite the fact that there were no diplomatic relations, were you given a hard time to get? Interestingly enough, and I should say this, I've never had an easier time getting a visa. I thought that was going to be a total pain. It was only $20, and it was easy to get. Now, I'm very methodical. I like to get stuff done. And I learned my lesson. You're only really supposed to apply for visas about three months before you go. And good thing I looked at it when it came back to me, because you know it's good for so many days from when you apply. And of course, the visa wasn't lasting through my entire trip. The guy didn't read my paperwork or didn't care. And I had to reapply for a new visa. Forget the $20. It's the FedEx both ways that can kill you. So I, now I know better live and learn. But it was a very easy process. Um, I've had interesting visas. Uh, I remember going to Libya. It was Gaddafi, like one day he'd give them out, and then the next day he wouldn't. And you could sign up for a trip and pay for a trip and then find out you weren't getting the visa. Right after I got in, people couldn't get in. And, and it was just what he felt like. But you know, I'm so glad I did the things I did. And I'm so glad I went to Syria when I did. I think my biggest regret was I never got to Iran before 9-11 because I know loads of people that loved it there. And um, I still would like to go, but it's just not the time to go. And my husband says he won't pay for it anyway. So. <laughs> loads of great places to go. You are a travel agent? I am. Which? I have my own Great Dane Travel uh, affiliated with a company out of Connecticut. I don't do a lot, but I do clients who like to go to exotic places. Um, I also am getting more into my photography and speaking, too. So doing a little of everything. But I, you know, I love to travel, and I'm going to do it anyway. So instead of making pictures and sticking a book on a shelf that nobody's going to look at, it's more fun to share. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Um, how did you fly into Burma? OK, so I, I had flown um, JFK to Singapore direct and used that as a great four days to sp or five days to spend in Singapore, because I hadn't been, which is really fun. And then on to Yangon from there, Singapore the Air. airport in It was Yangon, OK. It, it was fine. Like 1930 or? No, it was nice. I'm telling you, it was nice. Oh. It was nice. Yeah. And in fact, um, in Singapore, the orchid gardens are unbelievable. So I have some pictures out here. I'm actually doing an exhibit at the Cooley Dickinson in December. And I've got a long corridor. And my thing is faces of people from around the world. So I'm going to do a wall of faces and then a wall of flowers, international faces and flowers. So I encourage you to come look at my things. And, and uh, that's that. So 
Thank you for coming out on this crummy night. Thank you.